Welcome everybody to the Graduate School of Business for a uh, uh, symposium on what's going on in the world of credit and credit risk. Uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, faculty from the Business School, the Economics Department, the Law School, uh, Current and Emeriti, a distinguished group, so I want to get the program turned over right away to them. Let me just say, uh, by way of background, we uh, at the school obviously are always interested in what's going on in the economy and the world and the world of credit. I will tell you myself as a uh, longtime participant and observer of credit markets, uh, I have seen commercial real estate as a very big cause of credit risk problems once, no, twice, the 70s and the 80s. Uh, oil and gas loans, shipping loans, third world debt, uh, LBOs and highly leveraged transactions, uh, residential real estate now. Um, is really the cause of this particular problem. That's the first time I guess we've seen residential real estate. And the interesting and different feature of this is all previous crises were contained institutions by and large, commercial banks, other institutions, where you could sit down with institutions, work out the accounting, work out the resolution. Uh, this is a situation where credit has been securitized, marketized, distributed. Very difficult for the authorities to get their arms around the size, the shape, the location of the problem. The actual underlying economic issue, which is making bad loans, all of these credit cycles have been about making bad loans. Uh, probably not as big as some prior bad loan episodes as a share of the economy, but the problem has become a much, much bigger problem because of this interesting new dimension in the world of modern finance. So we have some great people here to talk about it. I'm gonna turn the floor over to Daryl Duffy who's going to explain the rules, introduce the speakers, and we will go from there with some presentations, and we will be an hour at least allocated to this, and I thank you for coming. Daryl? Thanks, Bob. Thanks for coming. Uh, you can see why we need a new campus. This room is too small. <laughs> um, so, as you know, this afternoon uh, it's reported, although it remains to be seen, uh, what happens. It's been reported that uh, Congress and the administration have agreed on the framework for a $700 billion purchase of uh, distressed assets from financial institutions with restrictions on CEO pay and some method by which uh, the institutions take part in this program will give something back to the federal government. However, that's a very uh, broad framework and we thought that you might not, uh, want to know more about what brought this on, um, the uh, likely uh, design or alternative designs for this bailout their advantages and disadvantages, uh, the likely effectiveness of this, most importantly, the cost to the taxpayer and the benefit to the economy <coughs> later on. So uh, Bob and Peter and I decided on very short notice to have a very impromptu uh, panel session, uh, giving uh, all of us, including the panel, the chance to learn from each other uh, uh, what, we are, what we're all thinking. So we have Peter DeMarzo uh, from, as you know, from our finance group, Monica Piazzesi, uh, from the Economics Department. Monica heads the Asset Pricing Program of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Jonathan Burke, who's just joined our uh, finance group from Berkeley. Professor Jim Van Horn, who never needs, needs an introduction at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Ken Singleton, also in our finance group. And Professor Joe Grinfest from the Stanford Law School. And uh, the, the format is, we'll each take, uh, our panelists will each take three minutes of uh, prepared remarks. If you can, try to hold your, your questions because we're gonna have a generous period at the end for question and discussion. And uh, Peter will uh, tee this up, put it in context, and then pass the microphone to each of our other panelists. Hi, thanks, uh, Daryl. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And um, I'm going to really just give some introduction and then move it along to our panelists who will um, give their uh, remarks before we move to question and answer. But I just wanted to say that you know, in the past year, and in particular in the past two weeks, we've really seen uh, some of the most dramatic events in financial market history uh, unfolding and certainly reshaping um, Wall Street and markets. We've seen uh, the bailout and sale of Bear Stearns, and then following from that, the nationalization of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, the rescue of AIG, um, uh, the, uh, the sale or conversion of the remaining investment banks on Wall Street, and as many have reported, sort of the end of the Wall Street model, uh, per se, in terms of investment banking. Um, we've also experienced um, some previously unthinkable financial market dislocations um, 
in the last couple of weeks. We've seen uh, the collapse, essentially, of short-term credit markets um, in uh, a variety of settings. We've seen zero and for uh, a few hours negative uh, interest rates on treasuries. So negative interest rates, meaning uh, investors paying the government to keep their money safe because they're not sure where else to put it. Um, so um, really pretty dramatic stuff. And uh, it feels uh, for many like you know we're, we're looking into the abyss, uh, perhaps. Um, and certainly uh, this is um, uh, quite, quite a financial crisis that we're experiencing. However, it's not the first. And um, unfortunately, probably won't be the last a financial crisis. So I thought it'd be useful to begin with some perspective uh, on that, and Jim Van Horn uh, uh, will give us some. Thank you, Peter. Uh, during the last 200 years, there have been 16 credit crises. Uh, they were all preceded by periods of speculative excesses, and while each was somewhat different in the type of excess, speculative excess, they were all marked by this common theme, speculative excess. On average, it took two, a uh, little over two years to purge the system of these speculative excesses and get back really to a solid financial footing. We are now in the first year of this purge. And the lessons of the past were not long remembered. Um, as the next economic expansion occurred, uh, market participants uh, deluded themselves with this, that somehow this time was different. And that preceded all of these, uh, or rather succeeded all of these speculative excesses of the past. And I include the government that diluted itself as well uh, along the line. Each credit crisis tended to be followed by a peak in bankruptcy filings and sometimes by a collapse in commodity prices. 2008 is not the most severe credit crisis that we've had. It's not the mildest by any stretch. Probably it's the most severe in the post-World War II period, with the possible exception of uh, 1974 and 75. However, government intervention in the market is the greatest since the 1930s. That seems clear to me. So that's just a brief historical perspective. With respect to the present bailout, I'll just list two concerns, uh, and my time then will be up. First. Um, one of the most troubling aspects to the bailout, in my judgment, is the lack of a precise pricing mechanism. The Treasury purposely has talked about reverse uh, auctions, but has not specified uh, what will be involved and is asking for more or less blanket authority. Secondly, the underlying problem, to a certain extent, is housing prices. And until they stabilize, and I expect that will not be the case until at least 2000, uh, late 2009 or 10. Uh, we will have further shoes to fall and further write-offs. So my two minutes are up, or three minutes are up. Peter, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jim. I just want to say, especially uh, coming on the heels of uh, Jim Van Horn, that um, you know, while the institutions of finance are being reshaped, I think the principles uh, certainly are not. And if we think about kind of the things leading up to this crisis, it, it almost reads like a syllabus from one of Jim's uh, uh, corporate finance courses in terms of, you know, beginning with sort of agency problems and incentive misalignment on the part of mortgage issuers who, uh, as we know, didn't have incentives uh, to worry about the, the quality of the, uh, of the loans that they were issuing. Um, and then leverage on Wall Street amplifying that shock because of the high leverage of the investment banks, you know, over 20 times leverage uh, not being unusual for many of these banks. And, you know, with that kind of leverage, a 5% shock to the value of assets can wipe out your equity pretty quickly. Um, and then finally, as we know, when a firm has too much leverage, investment banks being no different once they're over levered, uh, financial distress costs become important. We have problems of underinvestment and inability to, for them to invest in the market, and we see uh, markets collapsing. So a lot of the, the, the themes uh, that we know sort of more generally from corporate finance playing out, in this case, uh, in the financial sector through this, and uh, leading to the drying up of capital uh, in these markets and, and sort of this dysfunction that we've talked about of uh, uh, inability because of inability to invest by many of the participants in these markets. Um, but one sort of question is what, you know, is this, how different is this if this were affecting another industry? Many have argued that if we're another industry, the government wouldn't be intervening in the ways that it's proposing now. Uh, the fact that it's the financial 
sector, we're seeing a greater call for potentially for government intervention. And the question is, you know, is this different? Uh, what is the effect on the rest of the economy of uh, this financial crisis, or what, what, what might we expect from that? And to give us some perspective on that, I was going to pass to uh, Monica. Thanks. I wanted to talk about economic consequences of the, of the crisis, since uh, the goal of the bailout would be to avoid those bad economic consequences, like job losses. And so the, the idea is that uh, because of the crisis, we would see lower economic activity, lower growth in the form of a regular recession, or maybe even worse, longer periods of low economic growth. And so macroeconomists disagree on the importance of a financial sector. Most macroeconomists, the vast majority of macroeconomists, works with models where the financial sector is just like any other sector. Uh, so the idea is that business cycles are caused by real shocks, uh, oil price shocks, and they affect sectors, and they all co-move down in a recession. And so there's no need for the government to intervene in any, uh, to bail out any of these sectors. Take, uh, let's say, the 1970s in response to the oil price shock. You, see, you saw that car makers were doing poorly, much uh, worse than other sectors, but there was no sense in which the government should have intervened to bail out car makers uh, during the 70s. So if you take that framework and you apply it to the crisis today, there's no, there would be no sense in which the government would have to intervene uh, to bail out the financial sector. Um, there's only a small, small group of macroeconomists who think uh, that the financial sector is special and have been importing ideas from corporate finance, in fact, to standard models of macro. And uh, this group includes Ben Bernanke. So we know that one person who's uh, the, in charge of the Fed right now thinks that the financial sector is important and is special. And these models, uh, basically, they have a role for net worth of the financial sector. That net worth is fluctuating over the business cycle. And as banks do poorly in recessions, they lend less. And so firms and consumers can borrow less. And that just slows down economic activity. And so this is the, the famous financial accelerator uh, by Ben Bernanke, this idea that banks over the business cycle make things worse and so amplify the cycle. And so the key question is, uh, in which world are we? Are we in the world where the financial sector, we should think of the financial sector as being special or not? And the, this debate is far from being resolved. Uh, one reason is that in the normal recession, you see all sectors move down together. And so you, there's, it's very difficult disentang to disentangle a special <coughs> role for the financial sector. Um, and so the, the question is, how do we do this? One, one way to go is to look at financial crisis in isolation, and maybe the current financial crisis is going to give us another data point to study and to figure out what the economic consequences are. But in general, what's missing, and I think what's missing uh, importantly from this dis current discussion about the bailout, is the magnitude of the real consequences, since that's going to then give us guidance on how much money we should act actually spend on the bailout. Uh, unless we know what the magnitude of those economic consequences are, we, we can't really determine that number. The other uh, thing is that we need to figure out in which world we are because we need to f determine how to treat financial firms. If they are special and we want to bail them out, then they should be regulated. Then deregulation in the 1980s was probably a bad idea and we should regulate them more. Uh, and if these firms expect to get uh, to share their losses with the taxpayer, there should be insurance premium that these firms pay to get the insurance. And ideally, this insurance pre these premium should depend on the amount of risk that these companies are taking. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's difficult to sort out where we are, but it's important because the whole uh, discussion of policy consequences changes drastically as, uh, depending on whether you think that the financial sector is important or not. Uh, thanks, Monica. And yes, it certainly seems that uh, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are convinced that, uh, that this is a big problem and that we need to spend uh, a large amount of uh, resources to basically restore confidence and, and, and stop, stop the bleeding in the markets. And uh, as you say, we'll have uh, more data after this uh, event, uh, like it or not. Um, so uh, let me turn it over to uh, Daryl to, uh, or Ken to, uh, to pick up from here. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to say a few words uh, about how I would characterize the current, the nature of the current crisis, and uh, and a little bit about the proposals on the table. 
to, to address it. Um, and in, in the q and I'll be happy to talk a lot more about how we got here. Uh, I think this started, we've heard a lot about credit. I think this started as a, as a, as a credit problem uh, related to misratings of, of a lot of structured products and, and a lack of, of, of full understanding of the nature of the inherent uh, risks uh, in, the, uh, in the underlyings that went into a lot of these structured products. But I think it's very much evolved into uh, a liquidity crisis, something we, a word we haven't heard yet too much today, a type of funding liquidity crisis where uh, it's very difficult for a lot of institutions to get funding and people are very nervous and reluctant uh, to commit capital. Uh, at the heart of this, I think, is the, the weak capital position of the financial sector, banks in particular. And this is, uh, uh, there's real reason to question the solvency of many of the financial institutions out there. This is brought to a virtual halt interbank lending. It's the, uh, it, it underpins the problems with regard to the, uh, the money market funds and, and their ability to, uh, uh, to hold funds and also their willingness to, uh, to fund in, 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 the, uh, uh, in, the bank, in the bank sector. So I think the the, the first step one has to think about in, in getting out of, of this uh, liquidity and credit crisis is, is how do we recapitalize the banking sector and at what level do we need to recapitalize it to um, undo this freeze as, as, it, as it's come to be called in markets, that is to, uh, to bring about uh, greater funding liquidity uh, in the system. Now, of course, one reason the capital is low is because of the large losses on a lot of mortgage and related products and, and structured products. So. Uh, what's on the table to, to address these issues? Well, the Treasury, in, in, in its modified, even in its modified form, basically is, seems like a rather indirect way of, of, of recapitalizing the banking system. Basically, if you mark to, to fire sale prices the, the assets that are on the balance sheets now, a large portion of the financial sector is insolvent. So the proposal on the table is essentially to buy at a higher price and I'm actually not quite so concerned about whether we're making a fair price for that. I think the real question is how much do we want to pay above the, uh, the, whole, the fire sale prices to inject capital into the system, and, 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 and how are we going to do that? How much are we going to pay? And obviously, the more we pay, the more capital we're putting in, but we're doing it in a rather indirect and inefficient way. Surely there's a more direct way to recognize the problem and, and possibly uh, address it. Uh, and one of the things that the discussion, we haven't seen too much discussion of, is, is whether or not the mechanisms that are in play will bring about a recapitalization that gets us anywhere close to where we need to be in order to unfreeze markets now, but also over the longer intermediate term, particularly as we're going into probably a weakening economy, a recession, if not something, if not something worse. Some of the other proposals that are on the table are essentially trying to get at the same question, but in, in a rather indirect way. We could, of course, just invest directly in the banking sector, and we're asking for equity back uh, in return for essentially paying for uh, uh, the liquidity premium, the li liquidity discount in the market, is essentially Bernanke's argument. Uh, I think it would make no sense to, to give away uh, that liquidity discount on the part of the American taxpayer, so getting some equity in return certainly seems, seems appropriate. There are other possibilities on the table. Um, uh, one of them is to, to change the value of the toxic assets themselves. The conservative Republicans have a proposal they're floating this afternoon that is essentially an insurance policy that I interpret as designed to raise the value of the toxic assets effectively on the balance sheets of these institutions without having to buy them off the books and therefore effectively raise capital. Uh, one could think about loan-like recapitalizations of these institutions as well. But the current system seems quite indirect. Um. Ken has alluded to the design of this bailout. So just to um, frame the discussion again in context, we've had a lot of discussion both here and uh, you've heard a lot about what got us to where we are, what are the implications to the macro economy and so on. But now in these next few days and weeks, the Treasury and the Fed uh, and Congress and the administration in general will work out what the $700 billion um, purchase plan will look like. Ken was alluding to some of the problems um, uh, with various design alternatives. And uh, just to make uh, even more stark this situation, the taxpayers and mem some members of Congress don't want to give away any wealth to the financial institutions that take part in this. 
On the other hand, the financial institutions have already voted not to write down these distressed assets because if they do, they will be seen to have less capital than they're supposed to have. And that e either they will be insolvent or they will lose the confidence of investors and that will be it for them. So some of the proposals in this design that would extract full market value uh, for these, uh, you know, the market value of these assets would cause these financial institutions essentially to write them down by selling them. And they may not want to participate in that exercise, as Ken has suggested. Uh, going the other way, uh, in order to get encouraged to participate, the taxpayer has to give up a lot more money. So, so now we are faced with, you know, real uh, uh, economics. We have to design, or we meaning uh, your government, has to design a plan by which we can accomplish both of these goals. That is, get rid of this gridlock in financial markets at a minimum cost subject to that objective. And based on uh, what Peter and I have heard that Jonathan and Joe Grinfest are going to talk about, we may hear some more specifics from them about um, better and worse ways to do this. If I could follow up briefly and then um, uh, say a couple things uh, on top of uh, Daryl's point, which is that, you know, the whole term market value is a little bit tricky these days because the argument is that the fire sale prices that we're seeing don't truly reflect the market value of many of these assets and that their true fundament fundamental value is higher. And so, you know, there's, in, in that sense, there may be some room to ease the burden without great taxpayer expense. Um, going on top of what fundamental value is would then obviously provide even more capital to banks, but then starts to uh, create taxpayer expense on top of that. But some of the debate seems to be about, you know, the $700 billion that's being used shouldn't be viewed directly as a cost to taxpayers because the government's going to get assets in return for the about $700 billion, but the whole question is what are those assets going to be worth? Um, I thought, let's go this way. I thought, Bob, you, I don't know if you want to say a few words about sort of from the banking's perspective on, uh, on these assets and, and how they've been treated uh, by banks in terms of their valuations. Well, a lot of banks, of course, can hold these for investment. And um, just like they held third world debt and commercial real estate in the past, I guess if I would make a banker argument, you'd say, look, you could say the taxpayers a lot of money by suspending mark-to-market accounting and go to some other kind of uh, intrinsic value accounting based on cash flows, not an arbitrary number that people can make up, but based on the cash flows of these underlying assets. These are real estate loans with people paying their mortgages, um, and uh, there's some loss expectation, but it's not 22 cents on the dollar of value. It's something, as Peter just said, north of that and north of what Merrill Lynch sold their whole portfolio to private equity funds. Uh, suspend market, mark to market accounting, let people value them just like they valued other loans in times of stress. Um, probably get rid of the, uh, get, bring back the uptick rule and, and, and get rid of some of the short selling uh, that's possible because what's happening now is people are marking to these fire sale values. Then they need capital. Their stock is crashing. They can't raise capital. So you just get a vicious downward cycle. So the bankers would argue if you could suspend this mark-to-market -market accounting, go to some other kind of intrinsic value accounting, deal with the short selling abuses, and probably for the moment suspend the application of Basel II, this capital requirement, so you don't just keep driving banks into the system. You, why spend the $700 billion? You could do a lot of this by uh, first doing that and then uh, save your, your firepower or your dry powder of the taxpayers and the Treasury when we see just exactly where the institutional problems are. I think that's a very quick thumbnail sketch where a lot of bankers would say, uh, this is running out of control here. Why do you need to buy all these assets as opposed to just let people value them? People can afford to hold them and get some confidence back in the system so that you don't have this absolute liquidity crunch that several have mentioned. It might be that we don't need a bailout. And the, I think the problem, <clears throat> it's not clear we'll ever, we could ever find out because the specter of the Great Depression is such an unpleasant event that I think most people's view is we don't want to find out if we don't need this bailout. <laughs> We'd rather just do the bailout mm -hmm. and, not, and, not, and, not, and not suffer the Great Depression. So if we're going to do the bailout, it seems to me there are three characteristics any bailout has to, has to satisfy. One is it has, to, it has to stabilize markets. 
The second is it must not occur at taxpayer expense. And the third one is it must not set up incentives so that in the future people will take more risk and will be faced with another bailout, just like we do. Now, the current proposal doesn't satisfy this, <coughs> and I'm frankly very surprised because I, you know, without any of the details that the government is, is, has privy to, can design a, uh, a bailout that would satisfy all three criteria. criteria. I'll, give, I'll tell you what that design is in a few minutes. But before I tell you that, I'm not suggesting this is what we should do. I'm just saying if I can design a bailout that satisfies those three criteria, I think any bailout should satisfy those three criteria. So the bailout that I would propose is exactly what the government has proposed. Let's buy the securities. Now, the problem is what are these securities worth? Well, let's say the, the bond has a face value of $100. It's currently trading at $0.30, cents, but we think there's a liquidity crisis and it really isn't worth $0.30. Cents. And there's very good reason to believe that it isn't worth $0.30. Cents. Okay? It's worth something greater than $0.30. Cents. My proposal is buy the bonds for $100. Then we're guaranteed we're not, uh, the, the government's uh, certainly overpaying for the bonds, so the, the public policy of injecting money into the system is going to be achieved. Later on, the government's going to turn around and sell these bonds. What you do is when you buy those bonds from the sellers, you get a, you get a guarantee from the sellers that they will make up any shortfall, any loss the government uh, 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 has on the sale of the securities. And furthermore, since it's the government, they can make this a tax. What that means is this would be the number one priority debt claim on any of these firms. So it would be a very safe claim. Right? We're giving them 100 okay, and we're going to ask them for $30 back a few, a few months, maybe a year later. Of a firm. These firms are not destitute. They still, even though they're, they're in, they have balance sheets that, that don't look very good, there's still a lot of value in those firms. So, this, so this, we would essentially get a, a loan. We would therefore be able to achieve the, uh, the, the bailout, but we would not be it at taxpayers' expense, because the people who are being bailed out would fund the bailout, and that <coughs> achieves the final objective, which is we're not having any handouts here. So ultimately, the people that took the risk are paying for their own risk. They don't think about a future possibility where the government would bail them out of their risk. So that's my, that's my two cents on what I think the government should do with the bailout. Professor Joe Grunfest. Great. Thanks, Daryl. You know, these days I'm getting lots of questions from my students that relate to the area of career advice, which we haven't gotten into. Uh, some of you at some point may have been thinking about careers in a uh, uh, business that we now teach as part of our legal history program. It's called investment banking. Okay. It used to be a fairly lucrative uh, business, and we're suggesting that our students consider careers in, in uh, for example, things like community organizing um, and, and life as a hockey mom. Although I must, as I look around the room, hockey mom is a more credible alternative for some of the people in this room than for others, and you know who you are. Um, let, me, let me take what I call the cocktail party approach, since I've got about two minutes. Let me take one minute to explain how we got into this mess in a way that has absolutely nothing to do with the financial sector and suggests we're in for a world of hurt, separate and apart from any of the factors that we've been talking about. And then another minute on what might be a better way to get out of this process? And I think it's, it's fairly to say that there's a great deal of skepticism in the room about the plan currently on the table being discussed in Washington. So, okay, 60 seconds on how we got into this mess. Very simply, look, for a variety of reasons, it seemed like a good idea at the time to keep interest rates relatively low, and it's very easy in hindsight to say we kept them lower than they should be, and that generated a massive, not, not, not large, massive asset bubble in residential real estate in the United States. The mark-to-market -market value of residential real estate at the peak in the U.S. was approximately $25 trillion. Let's assume real estate prices are down 20%, all right, and let's assume they're going to lose more. 20% of $25 trillion, ladies and gentlemen, is approximately how much? Five trillion dollars. Very the business school people are very good. You're right, there. They're very impressive. In addition, we've had a little bit of a loss in the uh, stock market. Have some of you noticed? All right. What's the value of the loss in the stock market? How many trillion? What would you guess? A trillion a day. A trillion a day. So let's. So what have we lost totally in the stock market? I haven't run the numbers lately. Say another trillion. Okay, it's more than that. More. Two, trillion. Two trillion. So we've taken at least seven trillion dollars out of the mark-to-market -market balance sheet of the U.S. consumer, all right? That's a rough estimate. 
if you think you're going to take that much money off the balance sheet without having a real macro effect, put aside all of these debates about whether financial services you know, have any effect, you're out of your frigging mind, all right? Because look at what happened when we had that additional $7 trillion there. People were borrowing against it so they could pay tuition at the business school at Stanford. They were, they were deciding to retire earlier. Why? Because they had $300,000 of equity in their home. Guess what? It's not there. All right? And if you think there are going to be no real effects because of this change in asset valuation, that's great. I'll trade against you, and I will take your money. I love you. All right? That's a piece of how we got into this mess. Now, how do we get out of this mess? What's interesting is there's a general consensus that we've got to pump money into the financial sector. There are smarter ways to pump money, and there are dumber ways to pump money. For a variety of reasons, I think the Treasury has come up with something that's sort of, you know, not terrible, not genius-like. But what's interesting is the flexibility written to the legislation, if it passes in the form like some of the drafts that have been floating around, gives us room to come up with improved mechanisms, because it says nothing about mechanism design. So let me share with you a thought that I'm working on about an alternative mechanism. And in order for a mechanism to be successful, it not only has to make financial sense, it has to make political sense. You've got to get people who are looking to be reelected, willing to stand up and say, I'm for that. So my suggestion is, instead of buying the instruments, which is what Paulson is thinking of doing, the securitized instruments, the collateralized instruments, and paying the banks for the instruments, what we should do is enter the market for the mortgages have the government buy the underlying mortgages themselves, but do it in a very interesting way. What we should do is say, look, we will buy all mortgages for, and I'm just making up the number, I'm not saying this is the right number, all right, for 50% of face value. Okay? Now, that'll do two things immediately. Number one, clearly any mortgage that has a value of less than 50% of face is going to be turned into the government. Now, these mortgages aren't worth zero. The government isn't going to lose, all right, the total amount of, of, of the mortgages. It rather, you know, the mortgages are worth, you know, on average, I think, 35 percent, 40 percent. You know, we, we're working on running the numbers. And we then know with precision how much the bailout is actually going to cost the taxpayer. Because today we don't know. We know it's some number lower than $700 million, all right, but we don't know what that number is. Taxpayer doesn't know. Right. Nobody knows. Okay? But on the other hand, if what you do is agree to buy back the mortgages at 50% of face, you know exactly what it is. The other thing is, if you think about how that works in terms of FAS 157 and Level 3 accounting, in effect, the government is agreeing to write a put option. When you run the models, you reduce the value of these portfolios when you've got a fat tail. All right? By standing there and saying, we will buy these mortgages at 50% of face, we cut off the fat tail. You cut off the fat tail when the auditors come in, you know, the, the mathematicians can say, well, you know, the value of our portfolio has now gone up very significantly because we don't have to worry about these mortgages declining to 40 percent of value or 30 percent because we can always sell it to the government for 50 percent, which then increases the value of instruments that haven't even been sold to the government because of the presence of this put. Okay? Now, there are all sorts of other, and politically, much more appealing to a representative or a senator to say, look, I vote for a system that puts the mortgage in the hands of the federal government where we can have FDIC-type programs, where we know we can renegotiate, let people stay in their homes. The FDIC typically takes 38% of income, all right? We don't have to worry about about foreclosures. Uh, we can renegotiate the length of the loans. We can renegotiate the interest payments. And that way we're not throwing my constituents out on the street all right, while the government controls the terms of the renegotiation on the paper. That's it. Question for uh, Professor Gunfest. Uh, last year um, at the law school, you predicted that it was going to get worse before it was going to get better. And in fact, you predicted that um, early January already. And my question is now, we are at that brink where it's very bad. I'd like to know, is it going to get more worse before it's going to get better? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's nice to have all my good predictions remembered and all the bad ones buried. I appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, it's going to get worse, all right? And, and, you know, I'm on tape and it's running, and if I'm wrong, you know, you can stand up in a year and say, Professor Grinfest, I can't believe I pay tuition. You told me a lie. 
Um, no, my bet is it's going to get worse, and it gets worse for a wide variety of reasons, including the fact is we haven't found the bottom uh, for the real estate market. Nobody really knows where that bottom is. That generates a lot of uncertainty, which then feeds through to asset pricing all right, in these models. So I, I think one of the things you want to do is chop off that fat tail and figure out some way that you can give the market comfort with regard to the prediction of values uh, in terms of, of what these institutions are worth. So I have a three-pronged question, which is always a bit risky, but I'm trying to make it work. Um, one, it seems like in the U.S. we get into these cycles of greed whereby, you know, whether it's Dexter Burnham and the junk bond collapse, NASDAQ and uh, the tech sector, or now with this mortgage thing, you know, don't bailouts just perpetuate a general cycle of greed? And isn't it just, are we going to just create another one that seven years from now we're going to do the same thing? Um, so I want to answer to that. Also, I think that uh, the uh, I think that finance gets treated specially because it operates under like a chicken little syndrome because financial crises happen very fast. Whether it's LTCM or this one, they happen in six months. If someone in 1978 told you in 30 years we're going to lose 80 percent of our textile and steel production and three and a half million jobs, that would have been a crisis, right? But because it happens over 30 years, we just ignore that sector. Finance happens quick, so we have this sort of big tendency to go for it. And the last one is I read a very interesting book by Nassim Taleb called Black Swan. And everyone is so quick. I went to a lunch hosted by Lance Bernstein two days ago. They're so quick to say, guys, look at history. We've seen this before. We've seen this before. When is this a black swan? When is this different? And overall, in terms of America's future health, I'm going to use a Roman analogy. I was a history major in college. I apologize. Is this Hannibal in Gaul or the Germanic tribes at the gate? I mean, <laughs> so that's sort of the bottom line for me. Okay, we can split this into three parts quickly. First one is on moral hazard. If we do this, are we going to encourage more of it? Anybody want to treat that one? I think that's kind of a given. It, it, well, if you don't no. have a, the only way to stop the moral hazard is make sure that the, gov the government doesn't subsidize the bailout. So if the government doesn't subsidize the bailout, then there's no moral hazard. Right. But I, I, I would submit very briefly the government is in the business of generating moral hazard because if, if you can't give a subsidy to your constituents, and the cheapest form of subsidy is one that doesn't show up on the accounting books of the government, which is one way or another of, of underpriced insurance. All right? uh, and if you have a look at the history of the United States government, it's in the business of generating moral hazard because it's politically profitable for our politicians to do that. You know, whether, whether it's people building homes uh, uh, in the path of hurricanes or, or, dare I say, linear accelerators that run right over the San Andreas Fault. I don't know any university that's done that. Uh, you know, it, it's everywhere. The second part of his question has to do, I think, with uh, one of the points that Monica was making about what's special about the financial sector that, that makes it different from any other sector in, in the way that these crises uh, should be treated. And Monica, you, you've already made some remarks. Do you want to follow up on that question or? Um, not re in terms of people moving, uh, was that the question about uh, the financial sector is losing jobs and comparing uh, that to the steel industry? It happens so quickly that you know, we have the tendency to react so quickly because we get big bailouts that aren't really thought out. Whereas other sectors that have had much worse times in yeah. America, because it happens over a long period yeah. of time, we don't as a public Definitely. Go, you know, <laughs> react in the same way. So I think that sometimes finance gets a special treatment for that. And so you can make the argument that the, you know workers are adjusting and finding new jobs, and so by if you give them time, people are going to move out of the financial industry, move, get different jobs, and so that problem is going to resolve itself. The question is, does the financial sector still play a special role because it's facilitating lending, uh, boring lending, and that, that if that's the case. Um, then you may want to protect those jobs, and they're special. And in that case, you may want to intervene. And the question is how to do that best. But there is a sense in which, so people, Ben Bernanke, for example, has argued that the financial sector is special. And in that case, those jobs are special. Right. Well, uh, yeah, you know, I would say finance is special. The sector is not. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you worked in the savings and loan industry in the 80s, it's gone. There is no savings and loan industry. Uh, but you have to be careful of people's store of value and their means of payment. I mean, that's how we all live, is we make payments and we have savings, and that's important. It's important to the economy and the public. Uh, but uh, nobody's trying to save a particular institution, I think. Let, right. let, me, let me take a shot at this, the third prong of your three-part question, and let's try to keep it to one prong from now on. <laughs> uh, I know Nassim Taleb, and I disagree with a lot of stuff in his book, but this idea of a black swan is obviously relevant. Mm -hmm. I think there's plenty of um, 
uh, blame to go around in this financial crisis of people not looking around corners, not imagining what might happen that hasn't already happened. Um, the ratings agencies were not thinking about what wasn't already in the statistics. Uh, the risk managers were assuming that the ratings were correct and that the market values that they were paying at the time represented fair market value. People were not asking <coughs> questions um, that uh, about things that could happen that, we, that weren't already in the models and in the data. And uh, that's, that's clearly one of the pieces of this puzzle. Regarding the point earlier made about moral hazard, Alexis de Tocqueville said the American Republic will last as long as the politicians realize they can bribe the people with their own money. And in looking at this situation, <laughs> I can't help but feel that way. Is it reasonable to ask the question, if the American public had $700 billion to spare on this bailout, that it would rush in from the private sector? Why do we need the government to be an intermediary in this situation? Who wants to field that one? Peter? Um, well, yeah, let me I'll make a few comments and then pass along to someone else. But uh, I think one issue is that it's been I mean, there have been attempts to motivate that, to try and get capital flowing in from the private sector. And there's sort of a coordination problem and the whole uncertainty about asset values that's in the way of that. So one of the goals, I think, of the Paulson-Bernanke plan is to try and reduce uh, some of that uncertainty about asset values to allow then normal channels of, uh, of equity to flow into these firms and allow them to recapitalize uh, in a better way. But you know, dysfunction in the market right now, uh, the view is that's making that difficult uh, to, to happen. So, um, but I, I certainly agree, and I think uh, that's been, if you look at you know, some of the other things that they've done up to this point, uh, I think their attempt has been to, to really facilitate uh, private capital flowing as well into these, into these firms. Jonathan and then Jim, want to address this point? But, uh, also, but let me I think there's a back of the envelope calculation I can show you to show you why there's a problem. Okay. If we look at mortgage default rates, and I would tell you that the average mortgage, we could, we would have average default rates of 20%. That would be historically unprecedented. In the Great Depression, I think the rates were 5%. Okay. So let's pick this. What, what, what were they? They were, uh, they were in the teens. They were in the teens. But they wouldn't be. They weren't 20, okay? 20%. <laughs> and, then I'm, and then I say to you, let's look at the recovery rate, um, the banks on a foreclosed loan. Let's take that 50%. In other words, the housing values have halved. That's a very big number. If you multiply 20 by 50, you get 10. That means the losses the banks expect with these very high numbers on the mortgages is 10%. The mortgages are, so how can you have numbers of 30 cents on the mortgages are trading? Nobody understands why those mortgages are, 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 are as panicked as they are. Jim? No, we, we face a liquidity crisis. The government is a lender of last resort and has to come to the rescue of the financial markets. This recurring theme of uh, credit crisis after credit crisis is with us. Um, it's going to continue to occur. And in 10 years, when you're out of here, we'll have another one. I favor substantial regulation of the financial institutions of this country as the only real course that will protect the American taxpayer from having these bailouts, these periodic bailouts. You want to follow up, Ken? Just, just adding something mm. a little anecdotal, but, mm. but I think relevant. Um, obviously, one of the issues that will come back mm. to be a part of your lives down the road is the incentive compensation schemes at financial mm. institutions uh, and how that interplays with risk management and whether or not it's a self-correcting mechanism. And uh, I've been talking a lot recently with someone in the midst of all of this in New York uh, who oversees uh, uh, the, the credit of one of the large financial institutions is very much in the middle of all this right now. He sees himself as having a year and a half, maybe two, to see if he can fundamentally change the culture of his institution, or we're right back where we were, and this will all be forgotten. Monica. I'm also having a hard time thinking about private capital not moving in, since if, if we're really so sure that these assets are undervalued, why is not somebody stepping in? I don't have to, uh, if, uh, I mean, why are we sitting here and not all rushing out and buying mortgage-backed securities? I'm, I, I'm not sure why, why there, that. There's a lot of private money moving in at 30 cents mm -hmm. and looking at very handsome returns. Yeah, but one of the problems is this, the returns, if you can't borrow, you can't really make much of a return. So let's say you buy the mortgages for 30 cents and they really worth 50 cents. 
Okay, so you've gone from 30 to 50. That's not going to be much of a return unless you can leverage it. But you can't leverage it. No, one, there's, a, there's something in the... In yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that depends. On <laughs> Hearing all these solutions really seems to target the short term versus the long term um, in terms of how people behave in the financial markets and what we need to do today to promote or incentivize people for the long term sustainability. Um, seeing that most of the national debt, 80%, was created in the 90s up to today, um, if we hypothetically had a $700 billion budget to get us out of this, has the government, or what do you guys think about a solution where the government doesn't act to bail out the financial sector, but uses it to bail out society in terms of uh, <coughs> quality of life? You know what I mean? Like, if, if you really need some sort of subsidy to help you as a citizen of the state to live, use that budget to use it in that sense rather than as an incentive to keep uh, motivating bad behavior in the short term. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a quick shot at that because that's something that was addressed by uh, Hank Paulson when he was asked the same question essentially by Congress. And he tried to make the point that it isn't really about bailing out the financial sector. It's really about improving uh, the situation for jobs and consumption by Americans. And it happens, as Monica said, that the financial sector is the valve through which the liquidity to producers and consumers flows. So if we want to improve the life of Americans according to this, uh, according to this hypothesis, then we have to start um, by, getting by taking the, making this valve unclogged and uh, getting liquidity flowing again into the general economy. Just to give you an idea, there's like $175 trillion of global financial assets, right? So if there's a run on the bank, which is what's happening, mm -hmm. and everybody wants those $175 trillion to come liquid, uh, you have huge destruction of value, some of the numbers people talk about. So $700 million on this $175 trillion pool is not very much. If we can save that value destruction in some way, that's what's motivating Hank and Ben. Let me just uh, follow up with one point on that. I think one of the weaknesses of the original proposal, and we'll see where it ends up, was not really distinguishing between what amount of that $700 billion would be a subsidy in some sense and therefore cost to the taxpayer, and what amount would be facilitating liquidity in the market and perhaps paying a fair price for assets the government would hold for a longer term and just provide liquidity in that market. Um, and so it's hard to say exactly what the price tag is at this point. And, you know, the, the original proposal gave the Treasury full discretion to determine that. Obviously, that's something that, you know, citizens, politicians, et cetera, have a view about, about if we're going to start doling out subsidies, um, then, you know, there are some issues about where they get spent. But I think one of the things that would be beneficial would be some transparency around that. The full $700 billion, certainly, given that their assets are going to be purchased in, in, in their place, would not be a, a subsidy and, and have some policy discussion about how that $700 billion gets split between those two roles. I was wondering how much you thought that the, uh, this liquidity crisis might ripple internationally and if the bailout plan should include the domestic or the U.S. arms of international banks. Great. That's an excellent question. Who wants to field it? <laughs> Jim? Well, it is international and it will quickly transmit across uh, the globalization of finance. Uh, and I think it is uh, wise to include uh, assets by foreign banks, U.S. assets by foreign banks, is my own feeling. It, 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 there's no doubt that it's international. The Chinese market is off 50 percent from its peak. The Indian market is off 50 percent from its peak. Uh, the Russian market was shut for three days uh, until they were sure that prices would go back up. Uh, British real estate values are just absolutely cratering and crumbling. Things don't look good in Spain. I mean, you can go down the list. Um, you don't have to speculate whether this is going to be a problem. It is a problem. Um, and, and it's just that we, the United States is the biggest and baddest and most notorious problem. Uh, there were, in fact, there was a run on the East Asian Bank of Hong Kong uh, early this morning. Um, and, you know, the U.S. is not interested in seeing that. Also, uh, God bless them, finance people are exceptionally good at figuring out how to deliver assets through U.S. financial institutions <coughs> that were not originally there. There are lots of ways to do it. Clearly, a lot of the blame lies with the credit rating agencies and maybe their incentives to compete with each other. How do you propose fixing this in the future so this doesn't happen again? Yes. I'll take 
Yeah, it's actually that's uh, actually a research project that I'm working on, and I'll just tell you very quickly. Um, there's so many different stories about what went on, all right, with the credit rating agencies and the like, and I don't think the government knows how to write rules to force people to write intelligent credit rating agencies, intelligent credit rating. But one common vector is that the incentives are all wrong when you have a situation where it's the people whose instruments are being rated are paying the rating agencies to do the rating. It's a little bit like the people that own the restaurants are paying the restaurant reviewers to do the reviews, okay? It's only a question of time until you get a bad meal, all right? And we just had it. So my proposal, and I'd love your reaction on this, is to create a new category of rating agencies, all right, that I call BOCRAs, all right, buyer-owned and controlled rating agencies. So in other words, there are all sorts of SEC rules and regulations that require that you have rating agency, you know, uh, ratings for a variety of purposes. You've got private contracts that are ubiquitous that require rating agencies. But now what you do is you say, wait a minute. Instead of simply being a rating agency, it has to be a rating agency that's owned and controlled by the buy side of the market, the people that buy the paper, all right? Now, they will then set the incentive structures for the people that um, are actually doing the rating. They will decide, you know, on all of the fees. There will be an automatic market for these guys because government regulations now say you have to have at least one rating by a BOCRA, all right? And if it turns out that the BOCRAs do a bad job with the ratings, which is highly likely to occur because doing a good rating is a hard thing to do, um, then the buy side has only itself to blame. All right. So there we are at least as close to incentive compatibility as I can imagine, given the fundamental difficulty of satisfying the job that the rating agencies need to do. Okay. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm there to disagree with people. So I, I think it's, complete, it's completely flawed, and here's why. It's not the rating agency's problem. I mean, if, what's more risky, bonds or stocks, <laughs> right. right? Nobody rates stocks. Nobody's saying they should be rating stocks, right? So what, what, what has it got to do with how rating agencies rate bonds? They weren't rating the stocks. The people, the, if you buy, these are, we're not talking about mom and pop people buying these securities. We're talking about sophisticated financial players buying these securities. They don't need to be protect, protected from anybody. We don't need any new regulations. We just have to make it clear to them that they bear the costs of their mistakes. Now, it's, I think the, even the executives, talking about executives is misplaced because, see, the problem with trying to regulate this is you're trying to regulate the smartest people in the economy. Investment bankers are paid the most because they're very, very smart. If you come up with a regulation, they're going to be smart enough to get around that regulation. So to try to pretend <laughs> that the government can out-regulate them is just, you're just dreaming. So instead, you've got to think about incentives. How do we set the incentives up? Now, the problem is compensation always works the following way. If you do well, you get, pay, you get, you get compensated. If you do badly, we can't take back the money we, we, we previously paid you. Because we cannot pay you this year, but we can't take back the money. So no matter what happens, you have to deal with that asymmetry, that option. Right. So the only way to try to make the, uh, the, 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 people, the risk takers... Uh, 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 not just go for broke because they're sitting on that option, is for the organizations to monitor them, right? Because if the, uh, if the risk taker increases his, the volatility of his bet because he knows he gets the upside and he doesn't have to take the, the downside, the people who take the downside are the organizations he works for. So it's very, very, very important that those organizations take a hit. Now, when Goldman Sachs was a partnership, the partners had unlimited liability. Right? So you can imagine how carefully they monitored their traders to make sure that they didn't abuse that option. So one, one possible solution to this is to force investment <laughs> banks to go back to being partnerships. I'm not suggesting that is the solution. But there are incentives. I really don't think we want to start with regulations to try to think. Thank you, and also thank you for your time tonight. I have a slightly more personal question than the ones that have been asking, but... I've heard a lot of really what sound to me like fantastic solutions and suggestions, and I'm very curious if any of you have spoken with Bernanke or Paulson or Bush or if anybody has actually contacted any of the decision makers involved in this process, and if not, do you plan to do so to make some of these suggestions? Jonathan, I think you wrote a They're letter. They're not answering their phones, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> if you have any contacts, I'd love. I have done my best. I have sent letters because <laughs> I feel incredibly strongly about this. I think we're, these people are just missing the boat here. So I have sent letters. Um, I've done what I've. I should have been working on other stuff this week, and that, all I've done is work on this. I wouldn't answer. Okay, last oh, question. Oh, it'd be interesting to hear um, your view on what role you think the. Um, Derivative, the emergence and proliferation of derivatives, particularly credit default swaps, played in the buildup uh, to this mess, how the existence of those instruments complicated the, the Fed and Treasury's bailout plan, and how you'd suggest kind of regulating that market going forward, if at all. Okay, I'll, I'll hit that one. Uh, credit default swaps, uh, in theory, do the same thing that the underlying bonds do. They just transfer the, exactly the same kind of risk as buying the bond or selling the bond. But in practice, you can do it a lot easier with a derivative than with a bond, which means if you want to take a lot of risk, it's really easy to do with derivatives, and you can get into a lot of trouble very quickly, which is what a lot of financial institutions did. You can also use derivatives to build these things called collateralized debt obligations that transfer risk in a much more toxic way. So what these credit derivatives did was it made it a lot easier for people to get into deep trouble. Um, uh, just in terms of the contracting requ uh, required. I in principle, I if you're going to uh, improve risk management or improve the regulation of financial institutions, you shouldn't need to shut down derivatives. They actually make the markets work more efficiently because they do make it easier to transfer risk. What you need to do, however, is to pay close attention uh, to those jobs. Uh, the rating, risk management, regulation have to be done a lot more carefully when it is so easy uh, uh, to concentrate very, a lot of risk in a very small toxic instrument like a credit derivative. I rather think that's another shoe that's going to fall. We have not only basic default swaps, credit default swaps, where certainly there is uh, settlement risk, but we have derivatives written against those credit default swaps and derivatives written against derivatives written against derivatives against basic credit default swaps. Uh, where the daisy chain ends, nobody knows. Yeah. Um, one of and I, I favor, I, I certainly favor regulation here. Yeah. But one, one, of the <laughs> one of the proposals is to improve transparency yeah. so that no matter how this daisy chain goes, it will always be possible for you to drill down through this daisy chain to the very bottom where you know who the, the borrower is and you know how much they owe and you can figure out how it's related to all of the other borrowers in that instrument. We didn't have that transparency and I'm pretty mm -hmm. confident next time They'll try to put it in there. I'm, uh, I'm not ex uh, as uh, pessimistic about the use of derivatives as Jim, but I do think they need to be controlled more, more carefully. Uh, we are out of time, so I think we need to. Uh, panelists will thank the audience, and the audience uh, can thank the panelists. <laughs>